I'm Sharon Van Sickle Robbins here in my first weeks as president of City Club, and I would like to welcome you all, those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB or KBPS radio, or watching on Portland Community Media's City Net 30. Thank you for joining City Club today on Friday, June 11th for this week's Friday Forum. Today we will hear from Robbie Diamond about how a new piece of proposed legislation could help bring electric vehicles to communities around the nation and why this matters. But first, some announcements. In consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, I ask everyone in the room who has not already done so to please silence your cell phones. First off, if there are any members who have joined the club in the last couple of months, Please stand and let us welcome you. Oh, we have a. Welcome. As always, we offer appreciation to those whose generous financial backing makes our time honored City Club luncheons possible. Please join me in offering an appreciative round of applause to the Don Sterling City Club Fund of the Oregon Community Foundation. We greatly appreciate your support. If your company or firm would like to be a City Club sponsor, please contact City Club staff at the back of the room or call the City Club office. In addition to Friday forums, City Club hosts many other events throughout the year, such as our Citizen Salon series. This dinner and discussion series brings together good food and great conversation, while at the same time supporting the vital mission of City Club. We invite you to join us for upcoming salons whose topics include the future of the Republican Party, the local music scene, and Portland's virtual museum of cities. At next week's Friday Forum, judges Ann Aiken and Michael Marcus will explain how a re-examination of our sentencing guidelines could decrease crime while lowering financial costs for our state's cities and counties. And now to today's program. As the oil continues to flow beneath the Gulf of Mexico, President Obama is calling upon Americans to reduce their dependence on fossil fuels. With the nation's transportation system heavily reliant on petroleum, this change is unlikely to occur unless Americans transform the way we move ourselves and our goods around the nation. In May of this year, Democrats and Republicans in both the U.S. House and Senate introduce legislation designed to advance the wide-scale adoption of electric vehicles and to develop the infrastructure needed to support them. In order to combat both our dependence on oil and the greenhouse gases emitted by our gas-powered vehicles. Today's speaker will describe the electrification roadmap this bill lays out and explain the impact this bill can have on our nation and environment. Today's speaker is president and CEO of the Electrification Coalition, a nonpartisan, not for profit group of business leaders committed to promoting policies that facilitate the deployment of electric vehicles on a mass scale. He is also the founder, president, and CEO of Securing America's Future Energy, a coalition of business leaders and retired senior military officers. These two groups work to shape legislation that offer alternatives to our nation's dependence on oil. Prior to his roles with SAFE and the Electrification Coalition, today's speaker served as Deputy Director of Community Outreach on Senator Joe Lieberman's 2004 presidential campaign. Before that, he was a director at the Washington, D.C. international trade consulting firm, Fontime International, working in all practice areas of the firm. And without further ado, please help me welcome today's speaker, Robbie Diamond. Well, thank you very much, uh, Sharon, uh, for that kind introduction. Congratulations on assuming the presidency of the City Club, and I, I wish you uh, the best of luck um, for your term uh, here, and I'm, I'm honored to be the first uh, speaker of your reign, I guess. And thank you, um, and thank you all for uh, joining me here today and, and for hosting me. Uh, this is an interesting time to talk about the threats posed by our nation's dependence on oil and the steps we must take to protect ourselves and our future. The danger, of course, has become even more crystal clear over the last month and a, ha and a half, as we, uh, over the last month and a half, 
as we have watched the crisis unfolding in the Gulf of Mexico. But the opportunity to face that danger has also been clarified in recent weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, Republicans and Democrats in both the House and the Senate introduced legislation that will put us on the pathway toward a stronger, safer, and cleaner America, an America that no longer relies on oil to run its cars and trucks. These bills could not have come at a more crucial time. Because the threat grows more pressing with every passing day, it is not just the Gulf. It's our economy, our national security, and our air quality. Here's what we face. The United States is the largest oil consumer, accounting for more nearly 25% of global demand. American use, Americans use approximately 20 million barrels of oil each day, and we are forced to import more than half of that amount. In 2008, when oil prices spiked, the U.S. trade deficit in crude oil and petroleum products reached $388 billion, 56% of our total trade deficit. A year later, with oil prices averaging just $62 per barrel and oil consumption down, the United States still ran a $200 billion trade deficit in oil and oil products. At the crux of America's oil dependence is the energy demand in our transportation sector. Transportation accounts for 70% of the total oil consumed by the United States. Americans' cars and trucks and planes and ships rely on oil for 94% of their fuel with no readily available substitutes or immediately available in anything approaching quantities that could run the system. This dependence represents an immediate and fundamental threat to our national security, our economic security, and our environmental security. There can be little doubt that a major part of the financial crisis that led to the global recession was the 2007 and 2008 run-up in oil prices. We saw an explosion in home ownership, with many purchases being made by people who had previously not qualified for mortgages. But when the price of oil and the price of gasoline began to rise, and inflation on commodities began to take hold, and interest rates began to increase, too many could no longer make their monthly payments. In fact, if taken separately, the spike in oil prices might have actually hurt nationwide household income more than the subprime mortgage meltdown. A typical subprime borrower with an adjustable rate mortgage might have seen his monthly payments, his or her monthly payments, on a $200,000 house go up by just under $400 a month as interest rates rose in 2007 and 2008. The median household, household in America, in the meantime, would have seen their energy costs go up by roughly $1,600 a year, or a little more than $130 a month. What's the major difference? That $1,600 a year is the average for all American households, not just one in 20 with a subprime mortgage. In total, across the economy, the damage, household that damage to household income from oil prices was much greater. And the steps we usually take to help strengthen the economy and to create jobs in times of weakness are just as easily overcome by oil price volatility. The total effect of changes to the federal tax code from 2008 to 2001 to 2008 was a decrease in annual federal income and estate taxes of about $1,900 for the median household but a typical household's energy costs rose more than that over the same period. In other words, every penny that most Americans saved due to federal income and estate tax cuts over the past eight years was spent on higher energy bills. All told, U.S. families and businesses spent more than $900 billion on refined oil products in 2008, representing 6.4% of our GDP. Today, prices are off their highs, but for how long? Oil was back above $80 per gallon earlier this spring and is still above $70 today. Many of the underlying fundamentals that pushed oil prices up are still present today. And once demand temporarily reduced due to our recession or our economic downturn begins to pick up again, prices are likely to follow. Our oil dependence could strangle an economic recovery just as it's beginning to take hold. The threat to American national security is equally as urgent. The vulnerability of global oil supply lines and infrastructure has driven the United States to accept the burden of securing the world's oil supply. Much of the infrastructure that delivers oil to the world market each day is exposed and vulnerable to attacks in unstable regions. Each day, more than 50% of the world's oil supplies must transit one of six maritime chokeholds, 
narrow shipping channels like the Strait of Hormuz between Iran and Qatar. Even a failed attempt to close one of these strategic passages could cause global oil prices to skyrocket. A successful closure and even one of the, uh, at even one of these choke points could bring economic catastrophe. To mitigate this risk, U.S. armed forces expend enormous resources patrolling oil transit routes and protecting chronically vulnerable infrastructure to hostile corners of the globe. This engagement benefits all nations, but comes primarily at the expense of the American military and ultimately the American taxpayer. A 2009 study by the RAND Corporation placed the cost of this defense burden at between 67 $0.5 billion and $83 billion annually. And that is to say nothing of the grave threat, uh, grave responsibility of putting our men and women in uniform in harm's way. Oil dependence also constrains U.S. foreign policy. Whether dealing with uranium enrichment in Iran or a hostile regime in Venezuela, American diplomacy is distorted by the need to minimize disruptions to the flow of oil. Too often oil dependence requires us to accommodate hostile governments that share neither our values nor our goals, putting both the United States and its allies at risk. Finally, a petroleum consumption, petroleum consumption poses a long-term threat to global environmental sustainability. Again, we can point to the Gulf, but that is far from the only environmental challenge posed by oil dependence. Consider that in 2007, petroleum was responsible for 43% of U.S. energy-related carbon dioxide emissions, 2,580 2, million metric tons. We cannot continue down this path. We cannot continue to send billions of dollars overseas and jobs overseas to pay for our addiction. We cannot continue to send men and women into harm's way to protect an increasingly vulnerable supply line. We cannot continue to put our future in the hands of hostile nations or fanatical terrorists who can turn, uh, who can turn off our crucial li oil lifeline at the drop of a hat. There is a solution, the linchpin of any plan that is serious about confronting oil dependence must transform a transportation system that today is almost entirely dependent on petroleum. The key is already at, at hand, literally. For all of you who have a cell phone or laptop computers with you today, the lithium ion batteries that power our personal electronics represent the nucleus of an electrified transportation sector that is simply put, the only practical solution to fundamentally end our nation's oil dependence. Electricity is produced from a wide variety of domestic fuel sources, natural gas, nuclear, coal, hydroelectric, wind, solar, and geothermal. A price spike in any one of these fuels has very little impact on the end price of electricity. No one fuel source or producer would be able to hold our transportation system or our economy hostage the way a single nation can disrupt, disrupt the flow of petroleum today. And by the way, just 1% of electric power generated in the, of the, in the United States in 2008 was derived from petroleum. Electrified transportation is cleaner than gas-powered cars as well. Right now, our internal combustion-based transportation system, as I said, is the single largest end-use emitter of energy-related carbon dioxide in the United States, accounting for 34% in 2007 emissions. The Natural Resources Defense Council published a study that said a car powered by a conventional internal combustion engine emits around 450 grams of carbon dioxide equivalent per mile. On the other hand, a plug-in hybrid, in the absolute worst case scenario according to their stu study, one whose power comes exclusively from old relatively dirty coal plants emits around 325 grams per mile. And of course, Electric cars are cleaner still when nuclear power and other clean renewable sources are part of the energy mix, as they, are, uh, as, they, as they are across the country. The price of electricity is far more stable than oil. Historically, we simply do not see the sudden price spikes that have hurt our oil-dependent economy so many times over the past, in the past. The backbone of the infrastructure of an electrified transportation system already exists. After all, all our homes and businesses are already connected to the grid. And there is substantial spare generation capacity. In fact, electric generation capacity represents perhaps our greatest untapped resource today. Generation is designed to be able to meet peak demand at the busiest time of the busiest day of the year. 
That means for much of the time, particularly at night, the enormous amount of capacity sits completely unused. Right now, we could power more than 100 million electric cars and trucks without building a new power plant, according to the Department of Energy National Labs. No other alternative to petroleum can claim these widespread advantages. This is not to say that other alternatives have no role to play in a post-petroleum transportation sector. On the contrary, natural gas, for example, may be used successfully in fleet vehicles, particularly those that can be centrally refueled, such as taxis, buses, specialized harbor and airport vehicles, and garbage trucks. Even more importantly, natural gas will play a crucial role in providing the electricity, a role which it can be far more, can, it can be, where it can be far more efficiently deployed than in the actual vehicles themselves. Other alternatives may also offer advantages in niche uses, but none offer the array of advantages that electricity does. Electrification can also represent a genuine bipartisan answer to a national problem at a time when the public is clamoring for Democrats and Republicans to work together to find real practical solutions. I think I would not be making any headlines by saying that we are not living in a time of bipartisan comedy in Washington, D.C. That is why the legislation that was introduced two weeks ago is so remarkable and so important. Here you had Democrats and Republicans, House members and senators coming together to say oil dependence represents a threat and electrification is the answer. I would like to thank the sponsors of those bills. On the Senate side, Oregon's own Jeff Merkley is one of the ones leading the charge, along with Senators Byron Dorgan and Lamar Alexander. Many of you have probably known Senator Merkley far longer than I have since he has only been in Washington since 2009. But in recent months, as I've worked with him and his staff, I've become more and more impressed. One thing is certain for sure, I'm excited to look forward to, to a future in which such champions of energy security and electrification are serving in Washington, D.C. On the House side, Representative Ed Markey, Judy Biggert, Anna Eshoo, Jerry McNerney introduced companion legislation to the Senate bill. We believe more, more co-sponsors from both parties are likely to join this legislative effort shortly. In fact, I think it is likely that the bill will represent a major part of any energy package that has passed this summer, something Majority Leader has, Reid has now made very clear that he wants done. By the way, I would also like to commend Leader Reid for a sense of urgency. He understands the need to get generally transformative energy bill passed and soon. That means he needs Republicans on board as well as Democrats. I believe these companion bills offer him a path forward a dramatic yet politically achievable solution. Oil dependence is not a Republican or Democratic problem. The threat is not just aimed at liberals or conservatives, environmentalists, or business owners. The danger is one we all share, and the solution should be the same. But what exactly is the solution? What do these bills actually do? They offer a detailed plan designed to avoid the traps that too many promising new technologies fall into. Here's what we need to avoid. It has now been more than 10 years since hybrids were first introduced in the United States. And despite government support and record high gas prices for part of that time, there are still only 1.5 million of them on the road, out of more than 250 million vehicles in the fleet. That is just not enough. We cannot let electric cars turn into another niche product. We cannot allow there used to be limited to environmentalists and technological enthusiasts. To make our nation's investment and the investment of the men and women like you worthwhile, and more importantly, to truly combat our oil dependence, we must put ourselves on a pathway towards millions, then tens of millions, then hundreds of millions of electric cars and trucks on the road. It is not, it is not as simple as flipping a switch. Electrification on a mass scale is an enormously complex undertaking. The issue is not simply one of putting the cars into showrooms. After all, will anyone buy the cars if there is no place to charge them? Will anyone build charging stations if there are no cars to use them? We cannot fall into that trap as well. That is why in November 2009, the business leaders of the Electrification Coalition released the Electrification Roadmap, a sweeping step-by-step -step blueprint for the deployment of a fully integrated electric drive network in the United States over the coming decade decades. The legislation introduced two weeks ago echoes the approach we pioneered in the roadmap. In short, these bills would put into place a process under which the Department of Energy would select specific geographic areas 
in which all of the elements of an electrified transportation system are deployed simultaneously, thereby providing a crucial first step toward moving electrification beyond a niche product into a dominant, compelling, ubiquitous concept. These initial forays into localized electric transportation would accomplish three main goals. First, they will show the value of a fully operational, smart, integrated electrified transportation system, helping to guarantee that these vehicles are accepted and indeed coveted, not just by early adopters, but by typical families who will see their economic value. Second, they would serve as labs, showing what works well and what works better, so we can learn and expand electrification across the country. And third, they would provide the crucial economies of scale that are necessary to continue to reduce the price of electric vehicle components and charging infrastructure. These, bill, these bills envision between five and 15 communities. They'll be chosen in a competitive process, the goal in which is to find the very best places to roll out electrified transportation. Once the decisions are made, an array of targeted, temporary incentives will be deployed within the communities. The primary tools will be amplified tax credits for consumers and infrastructure providers, along with incentives for utilities. The plans put forward are for five years, and if fully implemented, would deploy a total of 600 to 700,000 electric vehicles and their infrastructure in the first deployment communities. The bills also clearly point toward what we call phase two on our roadmap, an additional round of communities, vehicles and infrastructure after the first five years. Now, there are a couple important points to make. First is the importance of the competition. In order to be selected, a community will need to present a comprehensive proposal similar to bids to, the ho to host the Olympic Games. Such a proposal would need to show capability and buy-in from a wide range of public and private players, including local governments, utilities, major employers, and more. We believe the result of passing this legislation will be a competition, a race to the top, as communities fight to present the most fertile ground for an exciting new technological rollout. Even those that are not ultimately selected will have, in order to compete, taken steps that will make the adoption and deployment of electric vehicles and infrastructure more achievable within their own borders. Of course, some communities are already taking some of those steps, like right here in Oregon. This state has been a pioneer in electrification. Charging infrastructure is going up all over the state, and not just from one provider. Oregon will be a test bed for Nissan, the Nissan LEAF, and your state government is working with Mitsubishi to perhaps bring the iMove here. You're already ahead of much of the rest of the country. Now, I need to be clear here. Should this legislation pass, the selection process will be by the Department of, of Energy. It will be open and transparent and not, put to find, and not to put a too fine a point on it. Uh, no one else, not me, not politicians, no one should be able to influence them that competition. So nothing I say here can or should be construed to mean that any of the initial deployment communities will necessarily be here in Oregon, but I will say this. The kind of commitment your state is showing is precisely the kind that I hope we will see in states, and counties, and cities across the country as they compete to become deployment communities. We will all benefit. And incidentally, those benefits will come in many shapes and forms far beyond deployment communities themselves. If this plan is successful, it would spur a market for electric vehicles. The goal, as I said, was 600 to 700,000 vehicles, which represents higher penetration rates than current production plans by the major automobile manufacturers. And just to be clear, these plans do nothing to limit or impede the current nationwide incentives for electric vehicles. What we are talking about is added incentives, which will spur added demand. And let's remember, even if you don't live in a deployment community, those cars, the batteries, the computers, the chargers, the smart meters, those will be built across the country. When a factory reopens in your hometown to build or support these vehicles, as we've already seen in places like Elkhart, Indiana, and Livonia, Michigan, those are real and tangible benefits for hardworking Americans. And that's just the start. We hear a lot about green technologies these days. We read every day about how they're there are fortunes to be made. But what will spur those technologies? How can we know what will open up that spigot? It's the car. The car is the killer app. Think about this. Say you live in one of the areas across the country that are introducing smart meters. 
The goal is to let you take control of your energy use, encouraging you to use power at night and other off-peak times when it's cheaper. But are you really going to wait until midnight to run the dishwasher every few days if it only saves you a dollar or less? Maybe in Oregon they would, but in many places they wouldn't. An electric vehicle, however, represents a far more significant use of power, typically as much, in fact, as the entire rest of your home. The difference between charging during the day and night represents a lot more than just a dollar, and you might be doing it every day instead of a few times a week. Suddenly, the smart meter becomes much more relevant to your life, and your relationship to electricity changes dramatically. That's what I mean by the killer app. It ties all the pieces together and gives them value. Advanced energy storage in the form of batteries, convenient and grid-friendly chargers, clean energy generation, smart meters, and smart grid software, all of it comes back to the car. If this legislation passes and these communities are successful, as I believe they will be, we will be witnessing the birth of an entire new industry in the United States. And by the way, let's hope it's here in the United States, because across Europe and Asia, more and more companies and countries are investing in electrification as a solution to their energy challenges. And if we join that race too late, we might end up electrifying our transportation system, but importing the technology. Now there's one thing I think is important to address. It is hard these days not to be concerned about our mounting national deficits and debt. And believe me, I understand that it is even harder to propose to increase government expenditures for any project, no matter how worthwhile. But in this case, the economic costs of inaction make the choice clear. Consider that one of the results of our oil dependence is the direct transfer of enormous amounts of American wealth and capital overseas. What would, be your household, what would your household budget be like if at midnight on December 31st, every single year, thousands of dollars simply vanished? What would it be like to start in the hole automatically, just like that year after year? That is what oil dependence is doing to our nation every year. It's like an automatic debit of hundreds of billions of dollars sent overseas every year to pay for our addiction. Hundreds of billions of dollars that could instead be paying for good services and jobs right here in the, here in the United States. Well, let's look at, uh, look at it another way. Consider that when the price of oil spiked in 2008, fuel costs for the Department of Defense alone, just the Department of Defense, increased by $6.5 billion. Those are real costs that we as taxpayers pay. Department of Energy researchers have estimated that the US oil dependence costs have been, were $577 billion in 2008 alone. Since 1970, the total cost has been more than $5 trillion. The plan we have proposed, on the other hand, has not been formally scored, but by all estimates, probably would cost no more than $2 billion a year. Now, we can and should take every penny seriously, but $2 billion versus just the $6.5 billion in just one agency of the government, or hundreds of billions of dollars sent overseas, or otherwise lost due to our addiction. Let's just say we think the math is clearly in our favor, but we decided to prove it. So shortly after completing the electrification roadmap, the Electrification Coalition commissioned the Inter-Industry Forecasting Project at the University of Maryland and Keybridge Research to study the long-term economic effects of our policy proposals. This expert modeling team collectively has decades of experience building and performing simulation studies with large-scale econometric models and conducting public policy research on energy and macroeconomic issues. Our goal was to produce a detailed, sober analysis based on conservative, realistic assumptions stretching out over the next 20 years. The independent modeling exercise concluded that if the policies we recommended were adopted and enabled us to meet the goals in that roadmap, the cumulative impact on the federal debt would be a positive $336 billion by 2030. We would have created a total of 1.9 million new jobs. The trade deficit would also improve by $127 billion a year. U.S. households would see their annual incomes increase and would be spending less per year on energy and transportation, leading to the typical household having 3,687 more real dollars every year to spend or save as they see fit. That is getting something for your money. 
It is the promise of a stronger consumer base, a smaller deficit. In short, an environment for economic success in the place of the weight of our oil dependence that's dragging us down. The opportunity before us is enormous. Electrification of transportation can enhance our national security, propel economic growth, and reduce carbon dioxide emissions. I believe that electric cars can and will change the face of our nation. I believe that we will be stronger and safer if they become a reality. I believe that our environment will be better protected. I believe that our children and our grandchildren will have the opportunity to work and invest in revitalized American energy, high-tech, and energy sectors. But I also believe that the status quo looms over us. This is the moment, and I think it's time to grab it. Thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. The first question for our speaker, as always, will be from our Friday Forum host. Our host today is Steve Rosenbaum. Steve serves as president and CEO of PopArt, an interactive marketing agency. He serves on the club's finance committee and is a member of the Board of Governors. Steve? Um. Subsidies are one form of incentive to get us to using alternative energy and uh, getting this effect of a, a race to the top and getting some of the benefits you were, you were talking about, uh, Ravi. Um, another approach is to internalize negative externalities and to, um, as part of that, through carbon taxes, taxes on foreign fuel consumption, uh, congestion pricing that uh, and some of those have the effects of getting people to bicycle more and to uh, drive less and to, to use the free market as opposed to uh, subsidies to achieve these goals so um, political viability aside because I think what what is politically viable today versus what is politically viable long term um, is, is to be determined. Um, how does your approach of, of this bill and subsidies uh, compare and how might it uh, contrast or work together with an approach that is more toward Peguvian taxes? Well, thank you very much for that uh, question. Uh, I, I'd say a, a few things. Well, first, uh, one reason I think that electrification might not happen in America is precisely uh, because uh, gasoline costs and diesel costs are higher in other parts of the world, uh, particularly in Europe. So I think the question we have is, I, I have total confidence that we will electrify transportation. The uh, internal combustion engine is so much less efficient than an electric motor that it's an inevitable, I think, progression. The question is, will it happen here first, as I said before, or in Europe or China? And certainly in Europe, because of that, the total cost of ownership of the car makes much more sense. So I would not argue with that assumption. But political viability is an important thing uh, as, as a group that cares about oil dependence and believes that we don't have time to wait. Um, I, I think I have to assess the political viability. And the United States has proven that that's not the approach it wants to take. Um, they have proven that um, in fuel economy standards. So the United States has chosen that instead of raising the cost of fuel, we're going to basically mandate our cars to be more efficient, which is essentially a backdoor tax in some ways, because you have to put more technology into the car to make it more efficient. And that's, that's fine, but let's, let's call it what it is, and uh, let's, uh, let's move on. I would note two things about uh, raising prices uh, that, uh, that doesn't totally support that notion. So one is a carbon tax. I think it's important to mention that there is no price on carbon that will change the price of gasoline to any point that people will change their habits. So even a $50 per ton price on carbon would get you 20, 25 cents increase in the price of gasoline. Now we see those fluctuations month to month and people don't change their habits. So I think it is very important when we talk about climate change legislation to understand that putting a price on carbon is really about driving the most carbon intensive fuels out of our economy and that has to do that is coal and that is in the electricity sector and that's a totally legitimate thing to do that we that we that we might uh, choose to do 
But at the same time, you can't say that we're going to get off foreign oil by putting a price on carbon. It would have to be a dedicated tax to gasoline um, or pro proposals like we're proposing here that are dedicated to the transportation sector, which is a very different dynamic than just uh, putting a price on carbon. And my, my last point has to do with deployment strategy. I do think it is very important to note that the deployment strategy and getting beyond the early adopters matters, I do believe, based on the size and scope of the United States. And so if someone said to me I could have much more incentives and I could have them for the whole country, um, or I could have the bill that uh, we've sort of put forward uh, and I've described today, where you have these concentrated communities uh, chosen through a competitive process, I would actually choose the concentrated communities um, in the competitive process. I think it is very important that these vehicles get beyond, into the hands on a mass scale in these communities and beyond um, just the early adopters in order to deploy them for the whole country um, quicker. And so I do think that beyond price, one has to think of a deployment strategy, especially in a country our size and, and sort of its uh, makeup. And so I would say that uh, we should do some of this. I would say you could cut back a lot of the subsidy or a lot of those things, but you should still have to focus on the deployment strategy itself. We will now take questions from the floor. Asking questions at Friday Forums is a privilege of club membership. Before asking your question, please identify yourself as a City Club member and ask your question in 30 seconds or less. If I flash this question mark card, which you may remember from some of our recent candidate debates, it means please wrap up with your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Van uh, My name is Judith Barnes, City Club member, and uh, I want to uh, express appreciation to the speaker for um, bringing up this issue and letting us know about this national energy legislation. Um, I have a question. You have spoken um, uh, very eloquently about the uh, money we spend on protecting long fossil fuel supply chains and the benefits um, both economically and, and politically we could have from breaking our dependence on foreign fossil fuels sources. How, however, electric cars, it seems to me, are going to require new electricity generation. And how would you address, first of all, the comment that merely trading um, the uh, effluent from the tailpipe coming from oil, from uh, just exchanging that for um, CO2 coming out of smokestacks from coal plants is not really a solution to the environmental uh, issue which fossil fuel dependence creates for us. And secondly, um, in terms of generating electric energy from renewable non-polluting sources, do you have a comment on the policies that are making uh, great strides in producing electricity from renewables in Europe, which are called feed-in tariff policies, which now homeowners and businesses in Germany are installing 150 megawatts a month of solar energy based on these policies, and the fact, will our energy legislation at the national level make it easier for states to enact such policies, because we have just found in Oregon that we were not able to enact a true genuine feed-in tariff policy because of FERC preemption issues and problems with the Public Utilities Regulatory Perfor uh, Policies Act of 1978. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for those uh, questions. Uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, everyone else sit down. Um, so let me address the first question. I'm actually probably going to take a pass on the second one, but uh, let me get into the first one, um, which has to do with generation. So as I said in my remarks, um, uh, filling up your car, a plug-in hybrid or, or an electric vehicle, um, using the dirtiest coal plants in the United States today is actually marginally better than uh, using just an internal uh, combustion uh, engine. So I think on, on the whole, it doesn't solve the problem, as I said, and so say we had only coal generation in the United States and we turned over these cars to it, you would still be in a better position. Two, but more importantly, and I think much more progressively, um, I have a, a few thoughts um, on that. Uh, number one is that um, you know it takes it takes about uh, 15 uh, years to turn over our fleet, and so every time we have a fuel economy increase in the United States, it has like a very slow impact. And my argument is, once we turn over the fleet once into an electric vehicle, you have now taken your carbon issue and pushed it up uh, stream into the generation. Uh, side. And so instead of regulating hundreds of millions of vehicles, you're now regulating thousands of power plants that make it much easier. Two is every step and every improvement in that power plant 
um, and in generation mix in the country, now has an effect on the entire transportation sector, where it wouldn't if they were still totally separate, transportation being oil and uh, electricity and uh, coming from uh, other fuels, uh, coal, et cetera. So I think that uh, it has a much more, uh, to, so to take the fleet, turn it over once, will have a much better impact as we improve the, uh, and it will be easier to regulate that uh, sector and it will have a much, uh, it will have a double impact as it goes uh, downstream once you get a better generation. And then finally, I, I would just say that, um, you know, that the, uh, the, um, the, the national labs have done a study on this and they've shown that you could power over 100 million cars in the United States, electric cars, um, without producing any new generation capacity in the United States whatsoever. So, I mean, as my mother used to say, you know, we should only have such problems. We should only have such problems that we now have to worry about, you know, new generation in the United States because of electric cars. I mean, you're talking decades and decades. Look at the numbers I've, uh, I've, uh, I've, I've laid out. So, uh, you know, I just think that, uh, you know, it is something we'll have to worry about, and hopefully we'll have to worry about that. And at the same time, you know, I hopefully the generation mix will get better. As for uh, feed-in tariffs, you know, I'm actually going to take a pass at it. Um, it's something I haven't studied enough to uh, comment, I think, uh, uh, fairly on it. I would say that about energy legislation overall in the U.S. Congress, you know, it's a, it's a real tough uh, issue um, because it's more of a regional issue than it is even a Democratic versus Republican issue. I think that, um, you know, there will be an energy bill coming out of the Senate uh, this summer. And I think there are three likelihoods, uh, I'll say, in uh, order of uh, uh, least likely to mo most likely uh, as, as the least likely being a climate bill. Um, uh, second will be an, what they call an energy only bill. And there they could have some things on renewables, on uh, the renewable electricity standard and others, probably not a feed in tariff. It's probably too late in the process to introduce those types of things. And then finally, uh, the least uh, or the most likely and the least comprehensive would be sort of an oil liability uh, type of uh, legislation that deals with the, the, the spill in the Gulf and what we're going to do going forward. I mean, you know, from our perspective, you know, the good thing about the electric uh, vehicles and the bill there is that it directly addresses the oil issue. And so uh, in either of those three options, I feel like we have a very good chance of, uh, of passing our legislation uh, as, a, as a piece of any of those, uh, of those uh, larger uh, ideas and bills. Uh, Jim Zarin, City Club member, and my question actually has to do with that uh, 100 million uh, vehicles that we could put on the uh, electric vehicles without any new power plant capacity, but I want to connect it up with another figure that I thought I heard you say. If we uh, could right now uh, use 100 million electric vehicles without increasing our uh, electric power plant capacity, but there's 250 million vehicles on the road, and my first thought was, well, gee, that means we'd have to increase our electric plant capacity by two and a half times. But then because I, too, have a mother, I'm not completely stupid, I realized we'd only use part of our existing capacity for that $100 million. Do you have an idea of how much additional power plant capacity we would have to fund and build in order to electrify the, you know, the total 250 million fleet or some order of magnitude? And are those costs figured into these uh, uh, costs that you're talking about? So for the, uh, the macroeconomic model, where we had 75% uh, of uh, vehicle miles traveled um, would be electric by 2040, there is some of that uh, gen new generation that's uh, figured in. Um, but it only happens in much later years uh, when you hit, you know, uh, 2030, 2035, actually 2035 um, and, uh, time frame. Um, you know, I think that there, look, no one really has an answer to that question. You know, there's a, it's a very fluid situation. Batteries are going to get better. Um, so storage is going to change. Um, the amount of energy you can get out of the battery will probably change. Um, the ability to produce electricity, you know, all, all these questions I think are just unknowns in the sense that uh, we, we know that uh, each, each technology is, is progressing, so we don't know really how much uh, we'll need. Um, I can tell you what, what is important to note is I said 100 million vehicles, but to be totally honest and fair, that would mean 100 million vehicles filling up at non-peak hours in the night. And so I do think that is why the smart grid and all these other uh, technologies are so important. So if we're actually going to have and, uh, and maximize you know, all this, um, you know, all this uh, spare electricity capacity, 
you have to make sure that you're filling your vehicles up in the times where that spare capacity uh, exists. So if it was just, oh, everyone wants to plug in whenever they want and they'll charge whenever they want, you would not have the, that, that, uh, that ability to do that without uh, new generation uh, facilities. The other thing is there are very big regional differences and you know it's hard to account for each of those. So different uh, states have, um, you know, different mixes of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a generation. That uh, deals with the carbon question. We've been asked many times, like, how much carbon would you really save? And you don't have an answer depending on, it all depends on how you think these vehicles will be deployed. If they're deployed in sort of the smiley face of the United States, you're gonna have less carbon. If it's in the middle of the country, you're gonna have more carbon because there's more coal generation. So, you know, all those questions, I really have to get to a detail that I, I think is sort of a, a impossible in, in many ways. Um, you know, the truth is we know how to produce electricity. We actually know how to do it carbon free. Um, and it's a matter of uh, the, the, the will to, uh, to do those things. And, and certainly the car, if people are filling up their cars, you know, believe me, uh, I don't think the legislators uh, want to make sure that they can fill them up. And the final thing I'd say is on transmission. That's why I think transmission is important. I don't think it's important fundamentally to drive, you know, electric vehicles themselves. I mean, that, this issue is not really a technical issue, um, as uh, most utilities will tell you. And each utility has a little bit of a different sense of this. But, uh, you know, this is about, you know, at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the transformer level on your block. You know, in some cities, you know, if each car represents the same amount of electricity as your home, and then five go into that block and the transformer is not ready for it, um, they, they have to upgrade the transformer. Once again, not a technical issue, really much more of an organizational uh, upgrading issue. But having a national grid where you can sell electricity across the country um, makes a lot of sense. And so that's one thing in our country that we don't have. We have an antiquated uh, grid and you're unable to get electricity from the places that's produced and in, especially the renewables uh, to places where people live. North Dakota is a great example. They have a, I think they're called the wind of Saudi Arabia, although everybody's the Saudi Arabia of something. I don't know what Oregon's the Saudi Arabia. You'll have to tell me later. But but uh, wind is the Saudi Arabia of, uh, of uh, uh, North Dakota, but people don't live there. So you can't get that electricity out to these. So I think that is an important component that has to be addressed. In fact, politically, the car is the killer app because it forces us to then go up the utility chain, both to the smart grid, transmission, and generation, and solve those problems as well. Mike Litt, City Club member. Um, I'd love an electric car. But the problem is, although most days I only drive 20, 30 miles, once or twice a week I drive two or 300 miles. So does this bill in Congress uh, uh, include plug-in hybrids? Yes, so uh, the, the, the bill includes any electric drive uh, car. So whether it be, it's not technology specific. Uh, plug-in hybrids, hybrids, um, you know, any of those uh, vehicles. Uh, to your problem, look, I'm not here to say that there is the perfect solution for every person in every household in America today. There is not. I mean, the truth is that 80, over 80% 80 of trips are over five miles. And so the vast majority of people, this is a sufficient technology at the moment. Um, and that will improve over time and people's needs will change. People have two cars, it makes a lot of sense. People live in certain areas. Um, but there's things like the plug-in hybrid that offers range extension. Um, that will uh, be important for some people. There's fast charging uh, that will uh, come into play, and some people believe the swapping of the battery will come into play for longer distances. So I think that um, there's a technology curve that will occur. The vast majority of people have, uh, have performance in their car they don't know they need. In some ways, I said that Europe had an advantage because uh, they have higher taxes. China actually has an advantage because people haven't really driven cars. I mean, Although they almost, you know, they sell more cars a year than us now, um, but still their, their car park is so small. Um, there's only nine cars per 1,000 potentially licensed drivers in China, where we have 1,140 cars per 1,000 registered licensed drivers in the United States. Uh, and India is only at 11, so think of the problem going forward. Um, France is about 700. But, you know, with any new technologies, there's iterations. I mean, everyone remembers the cell phone as a big cube, and now we have these little things in our, in our pockets. And so I think Chinese uh, people, as they have this iteration, are willing to live with a lot of difference. They don't think, oh, well, it doesn't go 300 miles. I can't do this, right? They think to themselves, like, oh, that's great. It goes 100 miles. It's perfect. And so I think that that is going to be an advantage for them, which is why I also think we need to be doing this. Thank you. Greg McPherson, City Club member. Uh, your remarks so far have talked exclusively about how our fleet is propelled, 
but anyone who's traveled to other parts of the world can, has seen a dramatic difference in the size and bulk of the individual vehicles in the fleet. Is there anything about this proposal that would also shrink the size of the American passenger vehicle uh, at the same time as changing how it's moved down the highway? Um, the simple answer to that is no. Um, the legislation is, as I said before, as technology neutral as one could uh, make it. Um, it's neutral on both the uh, cities that are chosen, neutral on the types of business models that are chosen by the cities that they want to present, um, and the businesses in those cities that they want to present, and, uh, and neutral on sort of the, the makeup of those uh, vehicles. It's about uh, electric drive. Um, and so, uh, I mean, that's really what, uh, that's what the bill does. Um, you know, for me, I mean, I know these are, these are questions that uh, people might disagree. I mean, it's less of a question of what the car looks like and more of a question on how it's fueled because I look at this from that uh, sort of first and foremost, the national and economic security and the and environmental security uh, piece. Now, that doesn't solve uh, traffic problems and other types of, uh, of issues, which I think the country will have to get on. Um, so if we raise our money uh, for, uh, for building our roads from gas taxes, essentially, uh, to the Highway Trust Fund, um, that has been shrinking, which is why the, the Highway Trust Fund is bankrupt right now. And so I think the country, like in Oregon, they tested vehicle miles traveled and sort of taxing that instead. And I think that those are the issues that will then be driven um, in the transportation sector um, as well, which is how do we pay for the infrastructure that we have in the country and uh, improve it, whether it be dynamic pricing, congestion pricing, VMT miles traveled. And that will then get into a little bit about what the vehicles look like as well, I think. Steve Shell, member, I'd like to return to the transmission question. Two, two aspects of that. One is, if I want to get juice from McNary Dam to Portland, I have trouble right now. And, and if, if, uh, if I were a terrorist and I wanted to pick out something that's vulnerable, I'd go after the transmission system. The question is, do you re does your bill do anything to address those two problems, and if so, what? So the legislation, as I described, only deals with the electric vehicle. I mean, it doesn't deal with smart grid. It does, you know, it's got certain provisions in it that you know force you in the bid to uh, to think about these things and to uh, address them. But it doesn't deal with the transmission issue itself. Now, the Energy and Natural Resources Committee in the Senate voted on bipartisan legislation that passed um, bipartisan um, in uh, June that we were very involved in and had uh, transmission sections in it. And I would say that. You know, for transmission, it's all about, you know, um, uh, siting, uh, planning siting, and then uh, cost allocation. And we've been uh, very, you know, favorably, you know, uh, disposed and been pushing for having this national grid as much as possible and having FERC um, have the, have the, uh, have the, uh, the power to think about the country as a whole instead of sort of these fiefdoms. Um, because that's what that's what's so important, as well as cost allocation. Those costs should be shared more uh, across the nation because we all benefit. But you know, I think they made some advances in that bill. If that passed as part of any energy pass uh, any energy package, I would say that would be a, a step forward. I don't think it's a dramatic step forward, but I think it is a very uh, good step forward. Um, I'd say you know, and I think that's an important component from the terrorist side. And I definitely think that we have issues. I mean, you can hear some uh, national security experts talk about you know the Chinese have uh, penetrated our grid before, uh, that they've uh, actually uh, you know taken down sections of the grid. I mean, you know, I, I don't have any top secret clearance to know uh, the truth to all those things. But you know, former uh, CIA director Jim Woolsey talks about things like that all the time. So. You know, I would say to you, uh, as someone who cares a great deal about national security, we should not be exchanging one national security threat for another. And that's why we have to be just as uh, vigilant on, uh, on thinking about um, lithium reserves and thinking about rare earth metals that are going to be needed to build the batteries and for other technologies, why we need to be vigilant on the, uh, the transmission of our electricity and the power plants themselves um, just as much. So I think that that is all uh, important. I don't think it detracts you know, from uh, starting this uh, process uh, forward with the electric vehicles uh, themselves. 
Paddy Tillett, City Club member, something we learned here when we built light rail was that it had a cool factor, that people were prepared to ride on something on rails, but they wouldn't ride on a bus. And I suspect that the same factor will play into the adoption of electric vehicles. You're probably quite knowledgeable about what's going on, but presumably we're looking at a completely different kind of vehicle, no engine compartment for a start, no big tank. I mean, yes, you've got some batteries, I, how, how, how would the vehicles vary? I mean, the first ones will be made to look just like gas guzzlers, but um, presumably the technology is going to take us to more exciting places. Can you talk about that? So, you know, I think that, um, you know, it's important that, uh, in some ways it's important they do look like gas guzzlers uh, at actually initially, so that they're, uh, those people who want the cool, and those people who want to, like, I can tell you my mother, who does drive a hybrid, but she waited for the Ford Escape instead of the uh, the Prius. You know, that was not her thing. She thought it looked uh, funny. So I'm actually hopeful that they'll have different uh, shapes and sizes for uh, for all our needs. Um, I think that uh, there is a cool factor, and I'm very confident that because of uh, sort of uh, the social networks and the technologies of today, these things will spread rather quickly. Now, some people compare it to the iPod, right? The iPod, you know, spread very quickly uh, once people could see it. Now, there is a little bit of a difference there, and the difference is that the iPod costs hundreds of dollars, where a car is generally your second largest uh, purchase uh, any, any person makes. So I think it's not uh, totally fair to, uh, you know, people don't just go up and say, oh, I'm giving up my car and taking this new car because, uh, because it's kind of cool and everything else. So um, I think that, uh, that there is a, a buzz factor. I think that the buzz matters in those geographic regions initially. That's why spreading them everywhere is not going to help you because what you want is that those communities to be like really focused on it. And I think that that will very quickly a spread between the enthusiasts and the and beyond the early adopters and spread throughout those communities. And I think it's important that communities are chosen are not just the enthusiast communities themselves. So it's great that Portland uh, could be chosen. Um, it's great that, uh, you know, San Francisco or Boulder, Colorado, but it's just as important and the bill lays out that they should have geographic uh, diversity. And I think that's an important factor. So I think there'll be a buzz between, you know, so if Houston you know, which I'm, I'm heading to on uh, Monday uh, to, brief, uh, to brief them and the city and everything else. They're very excited about this too, the oil capital of America. So I think that that is going to be a very important uh, component. And so to be on the early adopter users and beyond the early adopter cities. And I think that then there's a social network from one to the other, right? If Houston can do it, well, we can do it. If Portland can do it, we could do it. And that's why another why I think this concentration is so important to create that, you know, buzz factor, um, to create that uh, buzz factor, um, you know, over time. So, um, you know, where, where different car companies are going, I don't build cars for a living. I would say that we uh, worked with a fine group of uh, automotive engineers in putting together the roadmap. But I'm uh, humble enough to say that I don't actually do that myself and had to you know, hire uh, those engineers to deal with it. Um, you know, I think that you just see a spectrum of companies at the moment, and they don't know what to do. And I'd say most of them are very cautious. I think if left to our own devices, we'll produce a few cars. You know, there's really one company at the moment that I think everyone would agree is all in, and that's Nissan. Nissan has really bat all in that this is, is the future, and other auto companies are producing the cars. Some are a little against the car. Um, I think that will change over time. Um, I think that will change over time as well, so. We've run out of time for further questions, and I'll have to stop for this week. Please join us on June 18th as two distinguished judges explain how we might use thoughtful sentencing to reduce crime and transform offenders. And as we close, please join me in expressing our appreciation to today's guest, Robbie Diamond. We're adjourned. <laughs>